Welcome to the Vanderbilt Philosophy Faculty Interviews. I'm Scott Aiken, and this is Sarah Raskoff. Uh, you've been with us for a year now. Yep. Yeah, just over a year. Uh, you did your BA in philosophy at Lewis and Clark. Yep. Uh, before we started talking about this, uh, you had t you you had a little joke about what uh, about what you uh, about you going to college. Do you remember what you said to me? No. You said vegan girl goes to crunchy university. Uh -huh. <laughs> <That's weird. laughs> So uh, that's what those four years looked like. Yep. Pretty, sounds pretty awesome uh, there there in Portland. Uh, you did your PhD at the University of Arizona, yep. um, and you and you worked on meta ethics. Did a PhD, uh, wrote your dissertation on expressivism. expressivism. Mm -hmm. It's a realis, realism about about value on the cheap, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that's what you said. That's not me saying it. Yep. That's, yep. Yep. Uh, you did a postdoc at the National uh, Institute of Health. Yep. It was in Maryland, and then the, you worked at Oxford Uhiro Institute for Practical Ethics. That's right. And we re we recruited you from there. Yes. Yeah. So we did some interviews with you, yep. uh, little Zoom Zoom yep. interviews. Mm -hmm. And now you've been here at Vanderbilt for a year. Yep. We're really lucky to have you. Oh, thanks. I feel really lucky to be here. I love it. And thanks for talking with me this yeah, afternoon. Of it's, uh, this is great. Um, you specialize in practical ethics, mm -hmm. uh, medical ethics in particular, animal ethics, yep. food ethics. Yep. Uh, we got some got some questions about that yep, coming. Uh, uh, meta ethics and normative ethics and research on ethical decision-making, in particular with uh, pokes and nudges. Yep, exactly. Uh, this is a really robust uh, <laughs> program. How did you get into philosophy, and how do we get to this intersection yeah, of issues? This crazy place. So, um, <laughs> yeah, that, that, so I, I, um, I started in undergrad thinking I wanted to be a doctor. Both of my parents are doctors, and I sort of was convinced that the way to be a good person was to try to heal people. Okay, <laughs> um, yeah. And then I started taking, you know, in freshman year, I took uh, all the sort of pre-med classes. And then I thought sort of to ease my load, a, a baby ethics class with Jay Odenbaugh, oh, yeah. <laughs> which was awesome. I know you know him. Uh, hi, Jay. <laughs> hi, Jay. <laughs> um, and I just ended up finding my philosophy classes way more interesting and compelling than the science classes. And interestingly, had better experiences with the professors. And so, you know, in my science classes, I was one of like 60 students, um, probably one of like 40 of those who wanted to be a doctor. And in my philosophy classes, um, I was like one of 20 students and, you know, my professors always sort of knew who I was and were sort of really actively engaging with me, which made a huge difference to feeling sort of seen in the class, which um, I have sort of found very useful for my own teaching, thinking about like how to engage <laughs> students. Yeah. Um, but I think it was just sort of this thing where I kept on the pre-med track and just found myself increasingly liking my philosophy classes more than my science classes. And it all sort of came to a head one day when um, I had to make a decision about whether I would take this other science class that was at the same time as the philosophy of language class that was going to be offered in the spring semester. And the professor of the philosophy of language class like emailed me and was like, I just want you to know, I think you're really good at this and I would love to have you in my class. Um, and <laughs> you should take this class if you would like to go to graduate school in philosophy, which I would also support, which was just like wow. a bang of a moment for me. And also, I don't know, just like someone reaching out and being like, I think you're good at this and would support you trying to do this with your life was super... Yeah, it was just like a significant moment in my life where, you know, the path split and I was like, yeah. oh, maybe I could do this. Um, and so, yeah, I started taking more philosophy classes, sort of got on this track of like, I'm maybe going to be a philosopher um, and applied to graduate school. So and then to University of Arizona yep. uh, and a, a kind of a crucible for ethics there, too. Yes. A really great place to do it. Yeah, it was really cool. I remember when I first got to Arizona walking down the hallway and seeing um, like Mark Timmons and Harry Horgan like walking down the hall. And I've read all your stuff, I'm such a fan! I don't know, it's just like having like a fangirl moment where I was like, the, these are the people that I read in undergrad yeah. and feeling intimidated, but also just like, whoa, I get to study here with these people. Yeah. So that was really cool. That's great, and and a cool opportunity. And one of the things that it looks like happened is that we've got a, we've got a, 
a, a kind of a philosophy <laughs> philosophy for philosophers dissertation yeah. on meta ethics and a particular program in it yeah. um and then a, a sharp turn to a kind of a more applied a more uh more hey like let's talk let's talk about the skin in the game literally um <laughs> kind of cases so yeah. what prompted that change the sort of the high philosophy the theory about like what is what is it for something to be good to yeah. is this a good decision totally so yeah i think you you're you're really right so i i am um, you know i started as i said i like started off being interested in philosophy in this really practical and applied way and then um, as I got to graduate school, became increasingly interested in like really abstract questions about ethics to the point that I was working on this view, expressivism, which is, you know, probably like a, just a very theoretical branch of metaethics that is um, really interesting, but also not something that you can talk about with just anybody mm -hmm. um or not something that everybody really can see what's so compelling about like why you're yeah, interested it's got, and it's got a it's got a technical problem yes. we were joking about this before we started up yes. where you're like yeah it's got this cool technical problem yep. that philosophers love yep the frege each problem <laughs> um, <laughs> cool problem very cool problem but um very much a problem that only a select group of people will find interesting and so yeah i was joking with scott before we did this interview that um you know i remember going home for thanksgiving and you know at dinner some family was asking me like what i was working on at the time and i ended up like trying to explain the frege Keach problem at a thanksgiving dinner and everyone was just like cool you know <laughs> not not um yeah, and so... Pass the mashed potatoes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and maybe it was my fault. Maybe I didn't do a good job explaining it. But also, you know, I'm at a table full of um, just doctors who are just sure. like, this isn't the sort of problem that they're yeah. trying to find. And so... I, I, there's no appendix here. There's no I, appendix here. <laughs> Unless by appendix you mean, like, the appendix at the back of the book. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's works cited. Yeah, so works cited. Um, <laughs> and so I think um, something that, like, happened is... It got to me a little not being able to talk to other people about the things that I was working on in a way that everyone could understand was um, compelling. And I guess what I should say is at the same time in graduate school, I had um, continued to be interested in bioethics and medical ethics. And so um, I actually was on the bioethics committee at the University of Arizona. Um, a professor of philosophy, Michael Gill, who um, was on the committee, brought me as his graduate student. And so that was really cool. And then I continued to, you know, I taught medical ethics while I was a graduate student. And I applied to this bioethics boot camp that was at the University of Pennsylvania. That was a, um, a summer program. I got into that and it was awesome. I, I sort of saw that there were interesting ways to do bioethics that incorporated my skills as sort of like a technical philosopher and I was like maybe I could do this you know um so I gotta finish the dissertation right like the <laughs> dissertation is right now about expressivism and problems of transparency and metaethics like questions okay. about like um you know could a moral theory could an, a moral theory be true even if nobody sort of like believed that it was true or could recognize awesome question you know and so these sorts of issues finish the dissertation um, and then decided I was going to apply to postdocs in bioethics and just postdocs in bioethics. Wow. Um, because I wanted to sort of transition into a more sort of applied way of thinking about ethics and try and hone my skills in a way that I could feel good about, like that yeah. I was like making an impact or, or doing something that I, I could, yeah, just like talk to other people about and, you know, relate to others about the work that I was writing and stuff. Absolutely. And so just just the sort of the level of buy-in that's required for these uh, is, is yeah. you might say, there's a sort of an ease that happens with it. And also there's a sort of an, there's a difference making that the teaching yes. makes. And one of these places is with your new work on veganism, yeah. ethical veganism. Yep. Um, got a book in the works? Yep, I just got a contract for that book, so it's really exciting. Congratulations. Thank you so uh, much. Okay, we'll be, uh, <laughs> whenever it comes out, we'll make sure that I'll update <laughs> and then put a link for it down below. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, hey, congratulations. Thanks That's awesome. Thanks so much. I'm excited. And one of the interesting things about the, the this ethical veganism view is that one of the, a, a long-standing worry about veganism is that it's sort of, it's it's a it's a kind of got an odd implies can problem mm -hmm. for 
humans that have been especially have been acculturated to eating animal products and consuming them and wearing them and things like that. And it's like, look, we've, we've kind of been enculturated into it. It's, it's a great aspiration, but let's be real about this. And so you have an interesting modifier with the veganism that you call it wiggly <laughs> veganism. Yeah. Tell me about wiggly veganism. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, so let me think about the best way to sort of situate this question of wiggly veganism. I guess like one thing that lots of people sort of think of when they hear that you're an ethical vegan is they think of you as someone who has sort of got this religious fervor to your moral position um, and that the moral position that you're fixated on is one that is really obsessed with, um, you know, this idea of purity or perfection in veganism. So we avoid all animal products. We never purchase any animal product. We never consume any animal product, even if, you know, um, even if that food is gonna be thrown away, or, you know, even if, you know, something is brought to you by accident at the restaurant, you should send it back or, um, and so I guess I'm sort of interested in these kinds of questions about um, what could justify that kind of position, this kind of like purity driven veganism. Um, and I think what this sort of bottoms out in is what um, what grounds your moral conviction that you ought to abstain from eating animal products. And if you're like me and, and what what grounds your your view that you should abstain from consuming animal products is that animals are, are sentient beings and that um, the creation of animal products on factory farms causes an enormous number of animals, just an enormous amount of suffering. Um, and you know, the idea then just to follow this argument through is that you should abstain from consuming these products because um, you know, it's a small thing that you can do that will make a big difference to reducing animal suffering. So if, if what you care about is animal suffering, it'll sometimes be that um, what you ought to do, what kind of vegan you ought to be, doesn't necessarily suggest that you should be this purity obsessed vegan, right? So it might be that, you know, if the food is gonna be thrown away, then maybe you should eat that food, right? Because, you know, otherwise these animals sort of suffered for no reason and, and, and nobody's gonna, you know, it's like, this is just gonna go into the trash. Um, it's also sort of inspired by this idea of, I think that vegans often get a bad rep for being so purity obsessed in this sort of way. And um, that can make people think of veganism as something that is impossible for them. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, I could never do that. I could never, I could never give up animal products. And so I'm interested in this idea of veganism as something that is um, scalar. So you can be more or less vegan um, and you can do, you can, you can better approximate this ideal of not consuming animal products, or you can do a worse job approximating this ideal. Um, and yeah, I think this is like a more compelling way to think about veganism. I think it's a more inviting way to think about veganism. I think it's also a way that is um, likely, I mean, I guess this is what I mean by invited, but more likely to get sort of uptake among other people if you know, you don't think that veganism is something that requires perfection, um, but just requires, um, yeah, allows for some wiggle room. So that's yeah. where like the wiggly idea comes in. The wi right. There's the wiggle and the wiggly yes, veganism, exactly. which is that it's, it, that it's in some ways trying to live an ethical vision. Yes. Um, clearly tied to your expressivist, <laughs> interest in expressivism, that um, it expresses a kind of attitude and a, and, a, and a kind of an aspiration. Yes. And the other part of it is also owning up to our own imperfections. Yep. Uh, and the other, and the last part of it, and one of the things that seems so compelling to me about it is that it's also a form of indirect communication. Mm -hmm. That the challenge with the with veganism before was that you got the old joke: How do you know somebody you're talking to is a vegan? Mm -hmm. They'll don't worry, they'll tell you, <laughs> <laughs> right? But yeah. that's th this part of it is that we take that religious fervor out and it's no longer a kind of an alienating moral aspiration. It's yep. something that in some ways is someone living by their conscience. Yes. Yes. And I guess like one important thing to say is that I do think that there's a difference between what we might call like a wiggly vegan or um, as I sometimes like to think about it as like a pragmatic vegan um, and someone who just like identifies as like a reducitarian, someone who's just trying generally to eat less meat. A great question. Yeah. And so, I mean, I do think that we should strive for having sort of um, 
rules about like when we're willing to make as vegans I think we should have rules about when we're willing to make exceptions and the kinds of exceptions that we're willing to make um so I don't think this is just like a um just try to eat less meat and dairy and you count as a as a wiggly vegan yeah um but I think there are interesting questions too about how to draw the line between these different positions yeah and this is a puzzle where like when once we start fuzzing up fuzzing up the the, the sort of the sharp boundaries then things start kind of blending yes. together but one of the other things that it looks like is part of this is that there's a, again a kind of a communication with others yes. about this mm -hmm. that on the one hand you've got the direct communication hey looks like this causes do you do do chickens have to die for lunch what, yes. what, what are you talking about yeah but then the other part of it is in some ways living it which gives people a kind of maybe a nudge whenever they've got big decisions about their lives. And you've been looking at how people make these big decisions and how nudging affects them. So tell me about this research with nudges and this kind of indirect way that people's decisions get made. Yeah, so thanks. So I think um, my, I, see, I sort of see my, I, I haven't thought too much about the connections between veganism and nudging, though I do think that there are sort of like interesting questions there too and um, you know, like, should we nudge people towards vegan diets? You know, should we have like default veg at, um, you know, at conferences or at departmental events? Like just make yeah. sure that everything is vegetarian or vegan. Um, and you have to ask special for the ribs exactly, or something like that. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Or you have to like, you have to order it. Yeah. Separately. Yeah. Um, and actually at the You Hero Center where I worked prior to coming to Vanderbilt, um, all events were default veg, and that was really cool. Wow, I, okay. It was, it was awesome. I could eat everything, which was, <laughs> all, which was always an exciting thing for me. Um, but yeah, so this area of, this other area of um, bioethics that I've been really interested in is sort of this question of um, the permissible ways that we can influence the ways that people make choices. And so everyone sort of knows that, you know, it's morally wrong to coerce somebody to do something. Um, you shouldn't sort of just like force someone's hand that that would be wrong. Um, however, there's this other sort of class of interventions that people have thought to be a bit more uh, morally attractive called nudges, which essentially involves sort of like um, changing the default option or um, manipulating what philosophers or ec economists have called like the choice architecture, changing the presentation of options such that one option is much more salient. And, you know, it turns out that making one option much more salient really affects the choice that people make. And so the thought is, look, here's a way that we can try to influence the choices that people make um, that's morally innocent. We can change the ordering or we can we can nudge them towards certain options while still leaving them free to choose whatever it is that they want. And so this is sort of the paradigm of the nudging um, paradigm. And this paradigm has sort of entered into bioethics and research ethics with questions about like, um, should we nudge patients in clinical settings or should we, um, should we try to get people to make um, a choice that we think is good for them that they otherwise wouldn't make for themselves? And part of this is the fact that, especially with big decisions, mm -hmm. you're deciding not just between, you know, option A and option B, which in some ways are morally neutral in terms of, like, they're just different in their means. Sometimes it's choosing the kind of life that you're going to have on the other side of this. Exactly. It's like choosing maybe even the person that you are exactly. in that. So there's something formative about these decisions. Yes, exactly. And so um, I have some work on these idea, this, this idea of, when are these nudges sort of acceptable in clinical settings or research settings and when aren't they? And you know, we might think that like when someone faces a really low stakes decision, um, a really low stakes medical decision, there's nothing sort of unproblematic about maybe nudging them towards, you know, accepting the flu vaccine um, or, you know, um, you know, um, Ordering, I'm trying to think of another sort of low stakes nudge, but I think accepting the, 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 flu, the vaccine flu vaccine is, is like the best. <laughs> hey, I'm per somebody who's okay with, the, with with getting an injection, right? Yes, but that's, exactly. That's, yeah. um, but then I think that there are choices that arise in clinical settings that are higher stakes and that are more related to, um, yeah, this idea of like what kind of person one will be. Okay. Um, questions like whether to accept like a life saving. Um, a life-saving blood transfusion um, when doing so would violate your religious convictions that are sincerely held or um, you know whether or how to undergo sort of some kind of 
um, um, gender confirmation surgery that would make your um, your physical body better align with your felt gender identity, your gender identity, um, or you know whether or not to have an abortion, um, even if you feel some sort of moral compunction about having an abortion. And these are the kinds of questions where I think nudging is more problematic because I think it interferes with a really important part of someone's autonomy, the kind of autonomy that's involved in sort of shaping our life and deciding what kind of person we will be or the kind of identities that we will have. Um, and so, yeah, so I've done some work on sort of trying to separate out the kinds of decisions where I think these kinds of interventions are actually helpful and, um, you know, are good for patients and promote their autonomy and the kinds of situations where they're a little more suspect and we should be worried so about it. So this sounds really rich. Um, tell me how this works in the classroom, these discussions go in the classroom. Tell me about your classes. Yeah, so right now I'm teaching two classes. I'm teaching an intro to medical ethics class um, and an upper division class that I actually just created last spring for the philosophy department called Ethics in the Beginnings of Life, which is a class about procreative and reproductive ethics. Um, and it's it's awesome. I'm having a great time in both of these classes. Um, my intro to medical ethics class just introduces students to a lot of the basics of um, medical ethics. I'm working really hard this semester on trying to incorporate um, a lot of the experiences that I've had working as an ethics consult, um, as part of the ethics consultation service at Vanderbilt Medical Center, um, trying to make my class way more clinically relevant for students who are hoping to go to medical school because the majority of the students who take the intro to medical ethics class are on this track to go and become a doctor. So for instance, um, today in class, my students actually just completed um, a capacity assessment activity where they watched a video of a gentleman um, who's trying to make decisions about um, money, like financial decisions, um, and is talking to a woman who's interviewing him to try to assess his decision-making capacity. And the students were asked to apply the standard sort of Paul Applebaum framework for um, assessing decision-making capacity to this gentleman and what decisions they think he has the capacity to make. Wow. <laughs> um, it was my first time running this activity. My students seem to love it. And so hopefully it will be the first of many times. <laughs> okay, right. It's like that's in the check mark <laughs> yeah, pile yeah, for the next time great. around. Good. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I like that. I like to do that in my class. Um, and in my upper division class, um, it's a pretty cool class too. We start with this unit on procreation. So questions about um, whether you should have children, um, like should you bring a new being into existence or, you know, is it best not to do that? Um, and then we're turn to questions about um, adoption. Um, should you adopt instead of procreating? Um, or are there moral reasons to worry about adoption too? It turns out that there's a lot of really rich philosophical literature on um, arguments against adoption um, based on sort of both objections to the institution, like this idea that like where these, the way we get these children is bad. And also sort of arguments based on the interests of the child. So it's bad for these children to wow. be adopted. Wow. Um, and then we'll turn to questions of selection, genetic selection, like should you try to design your baby? Um, or is there something morally suspect about that? Um, and then we conclude with a unit on abortion, um, which basically just covers the questions of, uh, you know, does a fetus have moral status? And also, um, irrespective of whether a fetus has moral status, is abortion should abortion be um, legal and accessible? Um, and then that we conclude. <laughs> and so these are the two classes that we've got this fall. Yep. Um, uh, have we got any other undergrad? It's like you made a new undergraduate <laughs> class yep. for us. Do we have any more new ones coming our way? Um, so I hope to eventually be teaching an animal ethics class for undergrads. I taught an animal ethics seminar last semester for my um, for the un for the graduate students. Yeah, which was right. Really great. <laughs> um, and in the spring, I'm teaching a seminar on um, contemporary meta ethics for the graduate students. Okay, great. And I hope to also teach a version of that course to the um to the undergrads as well super yeah get back to the frega geach problem exactly. again. <laughs> yep. good and and so uh and so one of the other questions is uh 
so we've got the we've got the book on we've got the book on uh, 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 ethical veganism yep. coming through. Have we got any other publications about to come out or on their way on their way through or conference presentations ready to go? Yeah, so um, I just presented. I just am working on a bunch of different conference presentations that are subtle questions about ethical veganism. This idea of like um, thinking about veganism as something that's purity driven or thinking about it as something that's pragmatic. Um, I'm also working on sort of two, uh, two other papers right now. One is about moral uncertainty um, and clinical ethics consultation, and that's some work that I'm working on with um, another colleague in the department, Jacob Barrett and um, Andy Schmidt, um, who's not in our department, <laughs> he's in Germany. Um, and um, I, am, I have a paper coming out very soon um, that's about formative autonomy and abortion restrictions. Um, which was my job talk. That was the job talk. I remember that paper. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm happy to ha that it's coming out. And um, I'm excited about that. I feel like it's a relevant paper for our times. Indeed, a timely, a timely <laughs> piece and super and, and super interesting for uh, for the formative autonomy that some of the decision making is about not just about what our preferences are, but what we want to be. Yeah, what what our preferences will be. Yeah. Right? Wow. Wow. Sarah, thanks very much for yeah, your time with me. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, and thanks for watching.